mercy and grace unfold a hunger and thirst a hunger and thirst with arms stretched wide I know you hear my cry speak to me to me now I surrender I surrender I want to know you more I want to know you more I surrender I Surrender. I want to know you. I want to know you.
It's only Only you can make things right again Come chase our wandering hearts These prodigals we are Don't wait Don't wait Open up the heavens Pour out your presence We want to see revival Bring us back to
Good evening. Uh, we'd like to welcome y'all to Calvary Chapel Divine, Texas, for our Wednesday night Bible study. Um, we are going to be going over the book of Nehemiah on our Wednesday night Bible studies. I'm going to turn this this way so I can kind of, so I don't hurt my neck here. So we're actually going to be going over Wednesday nights. Uh, our Bible studies are going to be in the book of Nehemiah. And so we're going to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, as we uh, go through this book, this wonderful book. Um, that I think speaks to the times that we're in right now. I want to first thank everybody that uh, that made it out uh, on Sunday 
and and there were some things I actually forgot in the announcement, so I want to make sure I kind of go over those. Uh, the website uh, has all the information that you need uh, for the church, the location. Uh, if you if you want to donate there, you can donate through uh, the the church website at Calvary Chapel Divine Texas, and uh, and and you can do it through there. You can find out all the information about the church, about service times. Uh, we actually loaded all of our um, teachings that I've done. At, uh, you know, I've been teaching for some time over at Grace Calvary Chapel. So, um, and, and so those teachings that I've had there have been loaded up, and and the teaching that we did Sunday is already loaded up. So you can find it on Apple Podcast or or, or Google Podcast or Spotify. Uh, I think it's on iHeartRadio as well as TuneIn Radio. So you can you can listen to the teachings there. And so uh, we want to make sure you have access to God's Word as easy as possible, whether it's watching it online or either uh, being able to listen to it while you're in the car, because that's one of the big things that I like to do uh, as I drive sometimes is just have a sermon that I can go and listen to. So um, let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to get into uh, some, some things that we need to go over for the book of Nehemiah before we get started. And uh, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for today. Uh, we do pray and just ask that you be with us here. Uh, we ask that you bring people, Lord. We pray for uh, those that, that know you and those that don't know you, uh, that we would be able to, uh, you know, just be able to uh, be the salt and the light uh, here in Divine Texas. We thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be here in the Markin building and uh, we pray for them we pray for this building we pray for their business and we just thank you so much for their their heart uh, to allow us to be here and we just ask that you just continue to bless their family as well we do pray uh, for this church we pray lord for uh, just uh, for us to be able to be in your word tonight to be able to learn from your word to be able to apply your word uh, and and to understand we're living in a very uh, different time uh, than we did four years ago where, where we're seeing a lot of uh, progressive Christianity that's being preached and, and, uh, and a falling away. And it's almost, you know, as we get into this, this book, we just pray that we're able to, um, to just apply the truths that are in this book, especially about prayer, uh, that we would be a church that prays, individuals that pray, uh, and, and that's something that we definitely need more of uh, in this world. And so we ask uh, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're in the book of Nehemiah, chapters 1 through... Th uh, we're actually going to look at chapter, <laughs> chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And I entitled it, A Concerned Heart. Um, one of the things I do want to go over before we get into... Uh, since this is our actual first book for Calvary Chapel here in Divine, uh, you may not be familiar with the way that Calvary Chapel teaches the Word of God. Uh, one of the things that we, we, we take, uh, we do uh, wholeheartedly is to exegesis the, the, the Scripture. Now these may seem like uh, big terms or uh, or, or, you know, you may think, well, Mike, you, you're using big, big terminology and stuff. I, I, I'm not that, that, that smart guy. Uh, one of the things that I do wanted to let you know is that when we talk about exegesis and eisegesis, there are two com conflicting approaches to the Bible, and it's very important that we understand this because as we get into uh, the book of Nehemiah, uh, exegesis is, is when we have explanation of the text based on a careful objective analysis. And so the word exegesis literally means to lead out of. And that means that the interpreter is led to his, his conclusion by following the text. It's very important. Something that you probably have heard of before is called observation, interpretation, application. That's exegesis. And so that's important for us as we get into the Word of God because we want to make sure that, that exegesis does justice to the text. And exegesis is concerned with discovering the true meaning of the text, respecting in its grammar and, and its setting. And so that's very important because what we have happening today is we have a falling away 
of teachers that are doing eisegesis, which there, and I'll explain what that is when we talk about eisegesis, it, it actually is the approach to Scripture, and it's the interpretation, and it's a passage based on subjective, right? You're, you're basically using non-analytic words in reading, and, and you're, you're being led into the Scripture. So you basically are coming to God's Word and you have been led to it, and you're going to approach it in your own way, and 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 with your own ideas. You're eject, you're injecting your ideas into the text, and and there's actually a thing called eisegesis virus that's going on in the church right now. And so eisegesis, what they do is they get focused on making a point. And so I, I I'll let me give you an example of it because this is the easiest way to kind of understand it. Uh, if we look at Philippians chapter uh, 4, verses 13, we all know the verse, right? I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Now, you already know just by me saying that, you've, had that, you've heard that taken out of context before. Uh, people forget the verses before that. And that's why we always tell you you want to try to go five verses up and five verses down and, and understand the context of, of what you're reading. If we read the, the Scripture, it says, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. We need to stop for a second and look and see what, what the point is that's being made that Paul was making. If we look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, this is the actual point. It says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to, how to abound. In every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Now see, if we jump in in verse 13... We can take that wherever we go. You know, I can be in a bad situation and, and I can say, you know what, I can break out of prison because God strengthens me and that's wrong. And what we're saying is, is, is Paul is, is directly speaking to the fact that he's talking about contentment. He's talking about that God strengthens him. When, he's, when he was in prison, when he was at his low point, it was God who was his strength. He was able to endure and be content because it was God's strength behind him. There's nothing that can take that away from me is what Paul is saying. I have contentment in that. And see, that's what exegesis is. Eisegesis is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So whatever I want to do, Christ is going to strengthen me. And I'm going to interject that into the Scripture and that's wrong. And so we need to be very careful with that because that's what's happening a lot right now in our, in our churches uh, uh, across the United States. There are a lot of pastors that, that eisegesis, you know, the Joel Olsteins and, and, and those that just kind of cherry pick a verse and, and go whatever direction they want with it. And so when we exegesis, what's very important for us to understand is Calvary Chapel, we want to observe the text. What does it say? Who is, who is it, who's writing it? So who's the author? Who are they speaking to? What is the passage about? When does it take place? What is the author? What is he, why does the author write what he does? And how does the passage fit in with the context? What problems are, 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 uh, were the recipients facing? Is there a situation that's there? And then we look at the interpretation. What does it mean? Putting yourself in the author's shoes. You're, you're, you, what did the author intend to communicate? And I think that's where a lot of people mess up is because what they do is they play God and they want to put in what they want to put in and read the Scriptures the way they want it to, to read. And, and we have to be very careful with that. It's the author's intent, Right? What did God mean when He gave the Word to the authors? To the author of the, of the book? And how does the meaning match up with other Scriptures throughout the Bible? 
And then we have application, which is one of the most important parts of the Bible because we're not just supposed to read the Bible. We're supposed to read it, be obedient to it, and then apply it. And so application is actually how do I apply this truth in my life? How does this passage inform and how we relate to God and with others? Is there an example for me to follow? Is there a prayer for me to pray? Is there a promise for me to claim? Is there a command to obey? And the easy one to be would be love thy neighbor, right? That's, that's a, something that we're supposed to be obedient and do. There's a, a command there that we're supposed to do. And unfortunately what happens is people take things out of context. And so when we get into Scripture, one of the things I want to make sure you understand is as we teach the Word of God at Calvary Chapel Divine, the thing that we will do is we will exegesis the Scripture. Okay? That means we're going to go to the text and allow the text to do what the text needs to do and not eisegesis, not to try to put ourselves into the text or try to, try to cherry-pick something and, and make it work. That's not what we do. And so when we look at the book of Nehemiah, we're going to go through this verse by verse, chapter by chapter. That's what Calvary Chapel does. And, and I love Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse uh, 11 is one of the key verses in the Bible uh, for, for that book. It says, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who, delights, who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. And we're going to find out that Nehemiah's a, a, a wonderful book about, about revival and about restoration. And the other key verses in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. Now, that's a word that we're not usually used. Like derision is disgrace, is what it is in the concordance. Shame. Why? Because the nation of Israel kept falling. The nation of Israel was actually taken away, and, and we'll look at all of that as we get into the Scriptures. So as we look at Nehemiah, uh, over the chapters, what we'll see is we see the plans first. And that's going to be in chapters 1 and 2. And then we'll see the, the work and the work planned. And then we see the, the, the reconstruction that happens. And that's actually in verses 3 all the way to, to, to chapter 6. And then also the work that's threatened because they're going to have people that come against you and come against them. And, and so we'll see that anytime you're doing, you're called to do something that God's called you to do, you're going to have opposition. The enemy's not going to enjoy what you're uh, what you're planning to do, so he's going to try to keep the work of God from being done. And then in chapter 7, we see the resettlement when they all come back to Jerusalem. And that's actually in Scripture that that's supposed to happen, that prophecy. And then we see the beautiful revival that happens in chapters, uh, the rest of the remaining of chapter 7 and then and through chapter 9 and 10. And we actually see the first remnant of actually the church where they actually come together on a pulpit and they share the Word of God and everybody's listening. And that's a beautiful uh, passage that we'll get into. And then we see the, uh, the redistribution as they uh, build and, and get everybody back into the, uh, into the towns. And then we also have the reform that happens in the, in the last two chapters because they, unfortunately they do fall away. But it is revival for the nation. It's revival for the nation. If we look at the dates and stuff, it's really important as we look at it, the chronological relationship for Ezra. It's actually Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, the three of those. And Ezra actually deals with the first return of the Jews uh, from Babylon exile, the first return. And then there's a 58-year gap. And the book of Esther picks that up in, in 40, 483 and 473 B.C. 
this is just information that you, you need to know because as we dive into the book, you need to know kind of where... Uh, this is one of the things I always teach in school of ministry is you're dealing with real places during a real time with real people. It's very important to understand that. And then in Ezra chapter 7 through 10, we see the second return of the Jews from Babylon. And then finally, there's a 13 year gap that happens. And then the book of Nehemiah appears in the third return of the Jews from the Babylon, Babylonian exile. And so as we go through the book of Nehemiah, you know, it, it is the, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And, and, it's, and, 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 you know, there are people that say they don't know who the author is, but it's actually written from a per, first-person perspective. As if it came from his notes or him writing it directly. So we believe that Nehemiah was actually the, the author of the book, or at least it came from his writings. And we know that there are three notable prophets that, that had... Uh, during this time, we had Jeremiah trying to get them to repent and ministering to the southern kingdom. And, and, and sadly, you know, he, they, they, the nation of Israel wouldn't do it. And, and then we see uh, Daniel in chapter, uh, and actually 605 B.C. In chapter 1, he's, he's exiled. And, and, and he, was, he started in his writings ministering to the people. And around 595 B.C., Ezekiel was the second exile. Then Ezekiel in Babylon, he said, hey, you're going to be here a while. And, and so the third exile is actually the one where, unfortunately, uh, over a half a million men, women, and children were killed in Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar and them came through. But Jeremiah tried to tell them, judgment's coming. And Jeremiah chapter five, uh, 25, verses 11 and 12, it says, The whole land shall become a ruin and a waste. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation and the land of the Chaldeans for the iniquity de declares the Lord making the land an everlasting waste. So after the, the deaths of over a half a million Jews, Jeremiah writes lamentations. He laments and he writes lamentations. And Jeremiah told him that your 490 years of disobedience to the Lord, you ripped off the land. You disobeyed what, what God had, had told you to do, which is you're going to six years on, and take a year off. Give the land rest. And God said, because you rebelled against me, you owe me 70 years. And then He sends in Babylon to destroy the city. And Daniel in, in chapter 9, one of the things I love about Daniel is he realized that they were coming to the end of the 70 years. And what does Daniel do? This young man decides, you know what? I need to seek forgiveness from God and see what's next. We got the 70 years is coming to an end. What are we going to do next? And I want you to catch something here because this is very important. So anybody who tells me the Bible's not real, because in this scripture in Daniel chapter 9 verses 1 and 2, it lines up with Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12. What happened earlier when Jeremiah said that the Babylonian nation... The land of the Chaldeans for the iniquity declares the Lord making the land ever wet. He tells them, after the 70 years are complete, I'll punish the king of Babylon, right? And their nation. And their nation. And what does Daniel do? We, we know what happens. The prophecy was fulfilled in Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. It says, in the first year of Darius, the son... I, I won't even go there because I'll mess that up completely. Asarizos. I'm, I'm completely off. By descent of the Medes, who was in, uh, made the king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his, of his reign, Daniel perceived in the book of Numbers of the years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of desolation of Jerusalem, na namely 70 years. And so what do we see? 
we see the new king. And where does the king come from? The Chaldeans. So what did the Chaldeans do? They actually destroyed the nation of, of the Babylonians and the king. So the prophecy actually happens. And, and, and we see that, that fulfilled right here in Scripture. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, it says, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking Him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. This is very important because what Daniel's doing is he's asking God, Hey, Lord, the 70 years are up. We're seeking forgiveness. Tell us what we're supposed to do next. And, and then that, that happens through the rest of Daniel chapter 9. But see, Nehemiah had that same heart of prayer. Nehemiah had that same heart of caring for people, but also seeking God in prayer. So Nehemiah is actually the earliest record of God's people returning. And, and, and it's prophetic because in Jeremiah, it was told they would return in 70 years and it happened exactly at the time it was supposed to. Fulfilling the, the prophecy. And so this group of men with the heart to do something about the destruction of their city, God wanted to use them. And it would be Nehemiah who would lead them. Men not in Jerusalem, but they had a heart for Jerusalem. Nehemiah wasn't even in Jerusalem. But he had a heart for the nation of Israel. He had a heart for God's people and he had a heart for the Lord. The book of Nehemiah is a historical book of the Bible. But it continues you know, as a story of Israel's returning to, from their Babylonian captivity and the rebuilding of the temple. And, and this is going to happen again, the third temple. There was something that happened this past week. The Saudis actually said the Temple Mount, the mosque that's in, in Jerusalem, is not important to Islam. Now why is that, why is that a big thing? Because it wasn't just the Saudis that said it. It was the warlords. It was, it was uh, a number of people with influence in the Middle East. And they're telling us that the third temple, it, it has no importance to Islam. And that's important for this, this sole purpose. Why? Because the temple is going to be rebuilt again. And it has to be built at the same site. And so hopefully this is going to start the conversation and we'll see the things unfold as we see Bible prophecy unfold before our eyes. And it's, a, it's amazing to think that Nehemiah, this man of prayer, this man uh, uh, of, uh, of zealousness for God, what does he do? He actually builds a wall in 52 days. Him and the people. And it's actually a foreshadowing of Christ who prayed fervently for His people in a high priestly prayer. So Nehemiah and Jesus had a burning love for God's people, which we should have as well. But we should also have that same burning being poured out in prayer and going to the throne of the Lord and, and praying for not only our city, but our state, our leaders, and now as we get to Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1, I know that's probably the biggest intro, but we're only doing three verses tonight. So trust me, it's not going to be much longer. <laughs> so, but I want you to have an understanding. It's important that you understand the historical background. It's important that you understand that the prophets were, there were things that were happening, the captivity that was happening, the return that's going to happen, the, that Ezra and them try to go and go back and build the temple. And, and the temple was rebuilt, but the walls never got built, so people could not settle uh, back in Jerusalem because it was too dangerous. And so the walls needed to be built. If, if you were going to be in, you know, it's funny that we're talking about walls today, um, but if you were going to be a city that, was, uh, that could protect the people, they needed to have walls during this time. And, and so... It was an important thing in order for people to return back to Jerusalem. What's going to happen in these 52 days is so important for the return of the nation of Israel. 
and God's people uh, to come back and, and, and honestly, at the end of the day, get ready to set things up for uh, Jesus' return. Now, this book, just so you know, this, this is the last book in the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible. So, when we finish Nehemiah, that's when the 400 years of silence begins. Now, a lot of people don't understand, but if you read the, the book of Daniel, you'll find out that there, there really wasn't that much silence going on. God was in the background moving things and setting things up for His Son to come on the scene. And, and also for John the Baptist to come on the scene. So we're 400 years before John the Baptist comes on the scene and, and 400 years before, the, uh, before Jesus is on the scene as well. And, and so it's an amazing time to actually look at this Scripture and have an understanding of what's happening here. And to think that what they did with the temple, that, that it's going to be rebuilt again. The third temple is going to be rebuilt. And, and so that's an amazing thing. So Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The words of the son of, of Hakaliah, not, now it happened in the month of Kislev, uh, in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the citadel. So, yes, Susa is what it looks like, but it's actually pronounced Shushan. Uh, Hakaliah actually means uh, Jehovah enlightens. That's what that means, Jehovah enlightens. And then Shushan, just so you understand, this is, again, real places. Shushan was actually the citadel, and it was the winter re residence for the Persian king. This is where he would go during the winter time to relax, and it was actually... Uh, not too far from the Tigris River, and, and it's actually near the river of Ula. And I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but it was near the Kislev. And, and so uh, he said that they um, were in the 20th year, and this is very important to understand, that's the 20th year of Artaxerxes' reign, right? And, and so what we see is, is uh, it's the ninth month, which is the corresponding calendar. It would have been November, December. Right, and so uh, Shushan was actually about 200 miles southeast of Babylon, and at this time it wasn't really important, but it was. It, it eventually became the capital of Babylon, uh, or actually the eventually the capital of the Persian Empire, and so it had uh, canals and that flowed through it through the river of Ula, and and so that that's why it was important, and it was end up being used because of the water source. And we see here, and, and as we as we see Jehovah enlightens Hakaliah, right? Uh, Nehemiah, the the son of Hakaliah. Uh, we see in verse two it says, "Then Hanani, one of my brothers, came with uh, a certain man of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem." So Nehemiah hears, and he has real concern. Uh, he's really wanting to know what's happening and what's going on in Jerusalem. And, and, and unfortunately, it's not really good news. But there are times when we may ask somebody, hey, what's, what's going on? How are you doing? How are things going? And they just give you everything in one fell swoop. And that's really what happens in these verses. Uh, Nehemiah is fixing to get everything uh, from his, uh, his brother here. And one of his brothers, and, and he, he just, he's going to tell them everything that's happening. And, and so, concerning Jerusalem. And, and we see in verse 3, it says, And they said to them, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down, and the gates are destroyed by fire. So the news that he gets is almost like when somebody just tells you everything. He he he's he's telling him everything because it probably is it's it's heartbreaking to his brother, but it's also going to be heartbreaking to Nehemiah. And it's the same way that that Daniel, uh, you know, as they, he finds out the seventy years are coming up, he's gonna he's gonna go to the Lord and 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 just try to find out what's next and what needs to be done. And same thing with Jerusalem here. We see that the walls are broken down. And one of the things I always think about when I, when I, when I look at the book of Nehemiah is like, what is broken in our life? 
You know, if 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 our heart is the center of our life, is is we give our hearts to the Lord, is there something that's broken, you know, uh, in, in our hearts that God needs to rebuild or, or revive or restore? And and so sometimes that that that's what hits me when I think about this with the walls uh, being broken down. Sometimes we we allow sin in our lives and it and it destroys. And breaks down, uh, and 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 we allow things into our heart that we shouldn't allow. And and God wants to rebuild, and and all we have to do is repent, and He'll restore. And and honestly, I think one of the other big things we see is when we want restoration, or we want to have um, uh, to see God rebuild something in our life or revival in a city. It starts with us as individuals. And Nehemiah was that type of leader. Nehemiah was a man that led. He was a man of God. And, and, and he wasn't asking you to do anything that he wasn't doing as a leader. And, and I think that's an awesome, awesome trait, an awesome character of God to have that type of integrity as a leader. And we see, we know why, because one of the big questions I ask when I read the Scripture is like, why is it on fire Right? Why is it broken down? Why are the gates destroyed and on fire? Right? Because wasn't Ezra there and they built the temple? Why didn't they do the walls? But we see here in, in, in Ezra chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, we get a copy of the letter that was sent to Artaxerxes. And it says there, uh, the copy of the letter that was sent to Artaxerxes, the king, your servants, the men, of the providence beyond the river send greeting. And now be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from, uh, from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that re rebellious and wicked city. See, that's what the other nations thought of it. And, and this is why when it talks about derision, the shame, it's because Israel had God and yet they kept falling. They, they wouldn't be obedient to what God was asking them to do. And here, this is what the, the other nations think of them as they're this rebellious, re wicked city, right? And they're finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. And then King Artaxerxes orders the Jews to stop rebuilding. He says, that's it, don't do any more work. And so it's actually possible that the Persians could erect the work the Jews had already completed. That's a, a possibility, and, and maybe that's why his brothers described is his describing what the Persians may have done, and, and and that the walls had been and the gates had been burnt and broken, and that distress of, of the survivors they trickled back and they suffered personally. And the walls were burned down. And so in ancient times, again, no, no city could live without walls. Because it would be open season for the city. It, it would be hard to reestablish worship or to, or to reinvigorate the core of the national identity of the nation of Israel. Right? The city wasn't safe. They, they, people couldn't reside there. So how much could they worship there? The walls were broken, and so they were open to threat constantly. And so now you can see why Nehemiah is broken, because then when we look at verse 4, Nehemiah is broken. And, and, and he's going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I love this quote from, from Charles Spurgeon, uh, because Nehemiah was a man of zeal, and, and not in a way that's, Okay, you know, that was genuine. Have you met somebody that, that claims to be a Christian and they're, they're zealous, but it doesn't, the life doesn't match up? That's not Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king, and, and, and we may think that's not a big deal. Like, we hear cupbearer and we think, what is that? Just imagine, uh, the best way to put it today would be he would be the chief of staff for the president. He would, be, he would be the next to the president. Not the vice president. The vice president will never do anything. But the chief of staff handles all the appointments, sets all the, all the meetings. 
I mean, they're, they're involved in every detail, and that's how Nehemiah was with the king. He was involved in every detail and had to be trusted. Had to be trusted. But Nehemiah also had a zeal for his nation of Israel, but he had a bigger zeal for God. That's why he asked in concern. But Charles Spurgeon says this about zeal. He said, I, I wish that saints would cling to Christ half as earnestly as sinners cling to the devil. I'm going to read that again because that's a hard one. I wish that saints would cling to Christ half as earnestly as sinners cling to the devil. If we're willing to suffer for God as some are willing to suffer for their lust, what perseverance and seal would be seen on all sides? And see, I think what happens is we, we have we don't cling as cling to Christ the way that he clings to us. One thing that I hope that we get from this book as we finish up chapter one next week is one of the things I hope that we we learn is that in order for us uh, part of our, our relationship with Christ is prayer. It's being in the Word. It's fellowship. It's breaking bread and, and, and spending time with each other. But we need to have a commitment to prayer. And, 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 I, and I honestly, this was something that even that hit me again as I read this. It's like this is one of the areas I need to improve in in my life. Do you need to improve somewhere in your prayer life? Think about it. Do you need to pray for people? Pray about people. Pray for yourself. Pray for your church. Pray for your pastors, your leaders. Pray for the leaders in this nation. See, if you have questions or you have issues, are you praying about them? Are you opening God's Word and then praying about it? See, He'll give us direction, but the key is walking in the Spirit and accomplishing the work of God to be in constant communication with God, both receiving the Word of God and giving in to prayer. Are we willing to do that? See, what we'll find out next week in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, as we start off the, the, the chapter next week, we'll see it says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days. Mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I wonder, like, do we have that type of weeping for people who have fallen away in sin and praying for them? You know, we talk about Jeremiah and, and how he lamented for the people of Israel. Like, do we, do we lament for, for our friends and family members that we know have chosen not to follow God, but follow sin? Do we actually fast and pray for our nation? Or do we just complain about our leaders? It's easy to complain about our leaders. Because we see things that are happening throughout the United States that bring concern. We see this, and I'll talk about this Sunday, about this progressive Christianity that's happening and that's what eisegesis is. I think I, I had somebody send me something this week that, that showed Nancy Pelosi talking about the Mount of Transfiguration and using it as a crutch to, point, to, to push a political agenda. That's eisegesis. That's when we're interjecting what we want into the Scripture. And I'm afraid we, we need to be praying for our leaders because a lot of politicians and celebrities and and, and people of, of influence are, are, are taking God's Word and they're, they're making it their Word. And what I mean by that is they're, they're just taking the words that they want to pick from and choose and then they adapt it to whatever God they believe in. And it's unfortunate because what they do is they make themselves into a God. And because they're picking and choosing the Scripture the way that they want to do it and it's not, that's not how it's supposed to be. 
And see, when I, when, I, when I read that verse, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I'm like, when's the last time you actually heard the words or read the words of Jesus Christ or read the words that God has placed on the book in the Bible and you actually said, you know what, I need to stop and pray. I'm praying before the God of heaven. That's what, that's what Daniel did. He's like, they're going to go back now, Lord, but we need to ask for forgiveness. And we need to ask for direction as you send people back to Jerusalem. As Ezra went back to build the temple and, and as Nehemiah is going to go back to build the wall, and it's like we have to remember that, that it requires prayer. Everything starts with prayer. We didn't come to Calvary Divine without praying. We have our home church praying. We have Calvary New Spring praying for us. We have a, an abundance of people praying for the city of Divine and for Natalia and, and for Lytle and Bigfoot and Hondo. You know, we're, we're praying before the God of heaven, asking God to do a mighty work here in Divine. We've seen more traffic today than we've seen on Sunday, which is awesome. And, and we're hoping and praying that, that we can uh, hear the words of God tonight and pray for our city and pray for the people of this city because I know there's somebody hurting here tonight. It, it doesn't matter what city you're in. There's somebody that, that's suffering, that's somebody going through something. And, and, and we need to be praying for them. It's like, would you actually stop and pray for somebody? If they call you on the phone and something's happening, would you stop and pray? Would you, would you actually open the Word of God and ask God for direction? You know? And, and I can tell you, you know, we've, our family's been through it's been a, a, a crazy couple of weeks, you know, to get to this point. But I can tell you, as I, as I ask myself that question, is there somewhere that I can improve on in my prayer life? And it's yes. It's yes. I need to do it more. I need to be more committed to it. And, and, and I'm telling you that as a, as a pastor, that there, that's an area that I need work in. Where do you need it? Like, are, are, are you someone who's going to go and pray? And, 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 and understand that when you're praying, you're going, you're going before the God of heaven. The God of heaven. I'm excited to get into the book of Nehemiah. It is a wonderful book. And I pray that tonight when you heard these words, that you'll actually sit down and come and pray before the God of heaven. And pray for this city. For divine. Pray for the, the businesses in this city. There, there are probably businesses that are hurting because of COVID. And, and, and people that have probably lost their livelihoods or have had their, their work cut in half. And it's affecting their families. And see, that should actually, we should mourn with that. Because that means there are people hurting. There are, there are people addicted to stuff in this town. And, and we should weep and mourn and pray before the God of heaven for them to be released of that addiction. And so I'm going to close out in prayer. And then we're going to end our Bible study tonight. We'll be back here at 7 p.m. every Wednesday night. I would I, I love that you're online, but I would love for you to come in person. I would love for you to come in person. We'll be here Sunday at 10 a.m. We'll be talking about, we, we went over the sun, what it is to know and grow in Christ. And, and this week we'll be talking about being the salt and the light in this, in this city and in and, uh, and our families. And so let's go ahead and close out in prayer. Remember, if you need to find anything at all, you can do it at calvarydivine.org. If you need to get in contact with us, you can do it all through the website. 
You can send an email. You can call us. You can submit a prayer request right there on the website. So let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, for today. I do pray, Lord, as we hear those words, uh, I, I, that, that there would be an understanding of praying that we're going before the God of heaven. That there would be a reverence there. And, 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 I, and I, I ask, Lord, if there's anywhere that we need to improve in our prayer life, help us with that, Lord. Forgive us for, for neglecting it. We pray, Lord, as we get into the book of Nehemiah, there's probably some things that need to be restored in our lives. Maybe some stuff that needs to get rebuilt in our lives. Maybe a revival that needs to happen in our lives. And we pray for that. I pray, as, as Charles Spurgeon said, I pray that the saints would, not, would, would cling to Christ half as earnestly as sinners cling to the devil. We have a tendency to cling to the world and not to our Lord. And I pray that we would let go of the things of this world. We talked about putting our hands to the plow this week. And I pray that we can stay focused on You, Lord. I thank You so much for the opportunity to be in this building. We pray for Mark and Media, and we pray for Marcus and the family. We thank You for that opportunity. We pray and we just ask, Lord, that You would bring people to church. As we begin to open back up in Texas, I pray that people would, uh, would, would come back to church. And we thank you so much, Lord, for all that you're doing. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all so much. And uh, we will see you Sunday, 10 a.m. here at 203 East College Avenue, Suite C. The, it, right behind me is actually the color wall. And so when, as soon as you see that rainbow color, well, it's not really a rainbow, but as soon as you see the color wall, You'll see the sign out front that says Calvary Chapel Divine. Come on in and uh, come for service. We'll start at 10 o'clock, and I hope that you can make it. God bless.